Hey everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. So, oh God, today's case is so definitely one of the more unusual cases that we have covered on this channel. I just know that there are going to be so many different opinions on today's case. So we are heading back to the 90s for today's case and we are going to be diving into the various sex chat rooms that were available in the 90s, in the very beginning of the internet. And somebody that quite frequently visited these chat rooms was a woman called Sharon Lepaka. And Sharon offered a variety of different things on the internet for people with different fantasies. And then one day Sharon started talking to a man called Robert Glass. And the conversations between Sharon and Robert and some of the requests that were made would end in deadly consequences. So today's case is going to be a little bit of a strange one. I know that people are going to have very different opinions on today's case. And I'm really looking forward to reading the comments on today's video because yeah, this case definitely brings up some interesting topics for discussion, which obviously we are going to get into today. You know that I like to give you my opinion and I have some opinions on today's case. Oh boy, do I. And yeah, that is what we are talking about today. We're going to be talking about some very crazy stuff in today's case. So let's dive in. Sharon Lepatka was born on the 20th of September, 1961, making her a Virgo. And she grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, where she lived with her parents and her three younger siblings. Now, growing up, Sharon came from a very religious household. It was one of those households where it was very strict. You had to abide by all of the rules. And it has been described that Sharon's childhood was quite stifled. Sharon had to do what her parents expected her to do. She had to act in a certain way, dress in a certain way, talk in a certain way, believe in the same things as her parents believe in. However, despite this, Sharon really excelled in school. She had a lot of friends and she just got on with so many people. People thought that she had a great sense of humor and she has just been described as as normal as you can get. She was very active in sports. She played on both the volleyball and the hockey team. She sang in the school choir. She volunteered in the library at her school. And she also worked as a nurse's aide in her junior and senior years at high school. And by the time Sharon graduated high school, she just seemed to have everything going for her. She had gotten really good grades from high school and she had a lot of opportunities for her. A lot of doors were opening up for her. However, Sharon wanted to rebel. Sharon had gotten completely fed up with living under her parents' oppressive rules. So she wanted to rebel in a way that she knew would hurt her parents. So she started dating a lot of different guys, which her parents, they did not approve of this whatsoever. And Sharon, when she's dating around, she actually starts a very serious relationship with a guy from a different religion. Now, this was like a big no, no. This was probably one of the worst things that Sharon could have done to her parents. And this was a man called Victor Lopatka. He was a construction worker and Sharon completely fell head over heels in love with him. She didn't care what her parents thought. And this wasn't rebelling at this point. She just truly was in love with Victor. And in 1991, when Sharon is 30 years old, this is when Sharon and Victor got married and she did not have the blessing of her parents. I don't even know if her parents attended her wedding. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't. But Sharon didn't care. She was like, this is my life. I want to do what I want to do. And Victor is who I want to marry. So Sharon married him. She also didn't have any children, which again was her decision, which I can imagine her parents were not too pleased about that either. But after Sharon and Victor are married, they relocate to a ranch style house at the end of a cul-de-sac and they relocate to Hampstead, Maryland. And following the marriage to Victor, Sharon pretty much just broke away from her family. It is unclear how much contact she had with her family from this moment on, but it was pretty much non-existent. Sharon was just sick of the judgment from her parents. Her parents couldn't accept her for who she was. And this is when Sharon and Victor started living a nice, peaceful, quiet life together. Or at least that is what it seemed 
from the outside. So Sharon settles into her new home, her new life. I don't believe she had a job. It just said that she was a stay-at-home wife. Victor was the one that went out to work. And something that Sharon was really into was home decor and country crafts. And there's not really much to report for like the next few years. Sharon just kind of kept to herself. She was seen by the neighbors. And again, the neighbors have described Sharon as normal. However, then we get to 1995 and Sharon is 33 years old. And this is when Sharon discovers the internet. And that is pretty much where everything changes. So in 1995, this is the early days of the internet. There was no social media. There was no Amazon. Google didn't even exist. And it's just really hard to imagine what the internet would have looked like back then. And obviously I have gone back to like archives and stuff to like look to see what it would look like. And obviously you can see images of what the internet would look like, but it's just really hard to imagine what the internet looked like back in 1995. But it was a time where AOL and Yahoo were the most popular websites. And the most common way for people to communicate on the internet were through messaging boards. And there was message boards on pretty much everything. And this is where Sharon spent a lot of her time. She became absolutely fascinated by the internet, by the fact that you could communicate with anyone from all over the world. She started to frequent these messages boards, she started to make a lot of new friends and she discovered a whole world that she didn't know existed. And Sharon soon realized that she could use the internet to make money. Now, this is something very common nowadays, but you have to cast your minds back or try and imagine what it would have been like in 1995, the very beginning of the internet, or at least the very beginning of the internet where regular people in their homes were using the internet. The fact that Sharon realized that you could make money on the internet is pretty ahead of its time. I can't imagine that many people were doing it because making money on the internet was very, very unusual in 1995. But Sharon, this is exactly what she did. She was really ahead of the curve. She set up her own website, which she called House of Dion. And on this website, she combined her two biggest passions, which was country crafts and home decor. And on this website, Sharon started to sell a home decor magazine for $7. So people would go onto this website, they would order the magazine. I don't know how they would have paid for it. I mean, I don't know. Am I just being really dumb right now? But when could you actually purchase something online? Like enter your card details because when did PayPal exist? I can't imagine PayPal existed in 1995. Like, no, no, that can't possibly be. Am I just being really stupid right now? Would they have had to phone up and like given their card details over the phone? Is that how they would have done it? Why did I not think about this before I sat down to film? Like, why did I not research this? But anyway, people were going onto this website. They were ordering this $7 home decor magazine. Don't know how they were paying for it, but but Sharon would then send out this home decor magazine in the post. And on Sharon's website, her advertising slogan read, quote, home decorating secrets seen in the posh homes can now be yours. Quick, easy ways to decorate your home never published before. So it was just a magazine, like a home decor magazine. But back in 1995, to create this and to sell this online is pretty innovative. So Sharon was doing this for a short while and she was getting comfortable with her online business and making money online and just using the internet. And her eyes were soon opened to the fact that you could make money on the internet in so many different ways. And this is when Sharon became a little bit scammy because first Sharon set up a online persona, a woman called Velado Dion. And to be honest, I'm not 100% sure if that is how you pronounce it, Velado Velado? I'm just going to go with Velado Dion. And under this name, Velado Dion, Sharon claimed that she was, quote, America's favorite warlock 
who will cast a spell for you. Sharon was claiming all sorts on the internet that she was a warlock, that she was a witch, that she was a medium, that she was a psychic, which she was none of the above. But she told people that she was trained in magic and the mystical sciences. And she told people that she could see their future. So she set up a psychic hotline, which she ran from home and people would call into this hotline to ask Velado Dion what their future holds and they would pay a lot of money. But Sharon, she wasn't a medium. She wasn't a psychic. She was just scamming people. But not just that, Sharon set up so many different like businesses and avenues to scam people out of money. Sharon even started selling love potions online. She would target young vulnerable people that had recently had their heart broken and she would tell them, buy this love potion, it will fix all of your problems. And she would actually target teenagers, which obviously are more gullible, more naive. And God knows what she was actually sending through the post. Like, I don't know because she wasn't sending love potions through the post, that's for sure. But there was another avenue that Sharon went down. She started selling money making kits. And don't ask me what was in these money making kits, but I feel like you see things like that today, don't you? Where people claim that if you buy their course online, you can make so much money in a year, you will be a millionaire. You see so many of these scammy things online and that is basically what Sharon is doing. And in the end, Sharon ended up with four different social security numbers and her whole business and operation, it was just completely fraudulent. So Sharon is out and about on the internet scamming people left, right and centre. But then again, she realises that there is another thing that she can do that will make her a hell of a lot of money online. And unsurprisingly, that was sex. Sex sells. Sharon, on these chat rooms that she would quite often frequent, realised that there was a lot of people all over the world with a variety of different fantasies and fetishes. And Sharon decided decided to play into these. She realized that if she could, quote, fulfill people's fantasies, their fetishes, she could make a lot of money. And a lot of these people, especially people with more unconventional fetishes, they were ripe for being scammed. And there was also another bonus that Sharon thought of, that if you are scamming somebody over the internet whilst they're in the process of purchasing sexual content, they're less likely to go to the police if you scam them. Because number one, they may be too embarrassed. But number two, and this is obviously the bigger one, sometimes these people that Sharon was scamming, their sexual interests were illegal. So they couldn't exactly go running to the police, could they? So Sharon set up a, another online persona, and this was a woman called Nancy Carlson, where she described herself as a 25-year-old blonde woman who was five foot six and weighed 121 pounds. But that wasn't true. The only thing true out of that is that she was blonde. And to be honest, I'm not even sure if she was blonde at the time. I did read that she had dark hair. And the first thing Sharon, or should I say Nancy, realized that she could make quite a lot of money from was selling her used underwear. Sharon, Nancy, posted on these sex forums, quote, Hi, my name is Nancy. Is anyone out there interested in buying my worn panties? This is no joke or wacky internet scam. I am very serious about this. Again, it's not actually completely clear whether this was a scam or not. Was Sharon actually sending out her used underwear or was she just claiming that she would and scamming people out of their money? We don't know. However, the more Sharon participated in these sex chat rooms, these forums, the more she enjoyed participating in them. She started visiting sites such as sexbondage.com, feetfetish.com and alt.torture. And Sharon started to get into many active sexual conversations with so many different users and all of these users, they were anonymous. And Sharon was having the time of her life. She would engage in very raunchy conversations with men from all over the world. She would talk about how she wanted these men to rub her feet 
probably on the fetishfeet.com website, so that these other men could get off on their foot fetishes. She talked to other men that she wanted them to have sex with her when she's asleep to fulfill their fetish of wanting to have sex with an unconscious woman. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God, Joji Abara. Like, oh my God, was he a customer? I wouldn't be surprised. But Sharon was enjoying having all of these conversations and she was having a lot more conversations with various different men, with various different fetishes. And she was really playing into whatever fetish these men wanted. Now it is unclear whether Sharon was only doing this to hopefully scam these men later down the line? Or did she just enjoy talking to these men? Did she enjoy the power that she got from all of these men falling at her feet? Or did Sharon have some of these fetishes herself? It is unclear. It could be all of the above. However, things start to get a lot darker because the more Sharon got sucked in to these chat rooms, she started to come across a lot of people with questionable fetishes and fantasies, things that are illegal. And Sharon started promising these men that she would make pornographic videos for them. And I assume she was selling these videos because you know, Sharon, she's a money maker. And at first it's nothing illegal or sinister. She posted a message on a forum which said, quote, let me customize your most exciting bondage fantasy for you on VHS to watch and enjoy privately in the comfort of your own home. Prices start at $100. And Sharon, aka Nancy, said that she would both produce these videos and also star in them herself. So it started off completely fine. And to be honest, I don't know if Sharon was actually producing these videos. Like I don't know if she was recording herself. I just don't know. But when she started posting these things on the forum saying that she would make pornographic content for you, you, she started to get very troubling requests. And there was one request that she kept getting over and over again. And that was for her to make a video of a woman being raped when the woman is unconscious. People really wanted rape videos, which I'm not surprised at. I am disgusted by it, but I am not surprised at it. But Sharon, she agreed to make these videos. Now, again, it is unclear whether Sharon actually wanted to make pornographic content of women being raped, women being raped when they're unconscious, or was she just agreeing to make this content for money? So Sharon started to play into this even more. She would post on these forums saying, saying, quote, hi, my name is Nancy. I just made a VHS video of actual women willing and unwilling to be knocked out, drugged, under hypnosis and chloroformed. Never before has a film like this been made that shows the real beauty of a sleeping victim. Another message that she posted said, quote, let me customize your most exciting torture fantasy for you on VHS to watch and enjoy privately in the comfort of your own home. A film designed by you with scenarios of your choice. Films are shipped in plain envelopes to protect your privacy. And she gave these films names such as Land of the Frozen, which when you think about that, oh my God, that creeps me out because Land of the Frozen, in my mind, I am interpreting that as Land of the Frozen, i.e. Land of the Woman who is frozen is completely still because she's unconscious. And she provided production notes where she stated that 25 of the women that participated in these videos were attractive. They were under 30. And these women had volunteered without knowing that chloroform would be used on them. And she also said, quote, this is the pure beauty of this film, the realism. So this is just rape porn. That is what Sharon is selling online. And so many people bought this video or these videos off of Sharon, AKA Nancy. It is just so concerning, like Trudy, oh my God, what kind of world do we live in? And Sharon, oh my God, she was raking it in. She was making bank. Oh my God, she was making so much money. People were paying her hundreds of dollars and there were so many people paying her. And did Sharon 
actually possess these rape videos. Who knows? I think she was just scamming people because there is no such evidence that these VHS tapes or these videos, these films actually exist. And it didn't take long for a lot of Sharon's customers to complain that they hadn't received their VHS tape. A lot of people were saying that Sharon was a fraud, that she had just taken their money and not sent out their rape porn. Lots of people were complaining and saying that they wanted their money back. But did Sharon give any money back? No. And what could her customers do about it? Absolutely nothing. Because they have just gone on the internet and purchased rape porn. What are they going to do? Are they actually going to run to the police and say, oh, can you prosecute this woman because she hasn't sent out my rape porn? So after Sharon had been going around selling these rape videos for a while, this is when she moved on to her final scheme. Sharon created a new identity for her online persona, Nancy Carlson. So Nancy Carlson was now posting messages on these sex site forums saying that she was a strict dominatrix porn actress that weighed 300 pounds. And the sex forums that she was visiting, the fetishes that these people had, were for cannibalistic sex. So a lot of people on these forums that Sharon was on were looking to find a woman that wanted to be force-fed until she gained a lot of weight and then be eaten. Yeah, uh-huh. This is all real. And so Sharon was going on these forums and saying things like, quote, I have a fantasy of being kept completely naked, used for sex, fed well so that I would gain weight, and then sacrificed and cooked. I'd love to hear what you'd like to do to me. In another post, she said, quote, do you dare enter the land of the giantess where men are crushed like bugs by these angry yet gorgeous giant goddesses? She also posted on another forum that she wanted to be force fed until she reached her goal weight, which was 475 pounds, and that she was not interested in email correspondence or phone feeding, she wanted the real thing. And I just might be really dumb again here, but when she said she's not interested in phone feeding, does she mean like like sex talk, like on the phone, like eating on the phone? Like, you know what I mean? Like, am I just being really dumb here? And then she also said, quote, I am willing to relocate if that's what it takes to find the right feeder. I am hoping someone out there will help me and share in the most erotic experience of their life. And she also added, I don't want to break up any marriages. So if you're married, please don't respond to this post. And I'm like, Sharon, you're married. You're married. Hypocrite. Because Sharon's husband, Victor, has no idea about this side of his wife. Sharon is doing all of this in private, in secret. And these force feeding conversations went on for a while. But it turns out, as always, Sharon never followed through with any of her offers. And I just don't know what she's getting out of this. Does she actually want to be force fed? Like, is that actually a fantasy of hers? Is she again getting some some kind of monetary exchange from these conversations? Is she hoping to maybe scam these people later down the line? Like, I just don't know. And that's the thing with Sharon. And that's something that you all need to keep in mind with this case as we progress. We don't know what's real. However, things would soon become very real in this case. And that started when Sharon started visiting a website that catered to people that had a fetish of torturing someone to death. And again, this is real. Like these kinds of websites exist. So Sharon created a new online persona. She kind of retired Nancy for a short while and she created a new fake name for herself, which was Gina. And Gina headed to a sex forum where people's fantasies were necrophilia. Again, I'm just like, what the hell. And Sharon, aka Gina, posted on this forum, quote, hi, I'm Gina. Want to talk about torturing to death? And her post got so much attention. And it is worrying how many people responded to Gina about torturing someone to death. Many people responded saying, yes, I would love to talk about torture with you. Some said things like, quote, this scenario excites me a lot. 
I'm an experienced, pain-loving man who wants to exchange thoughts. Another said, My fantasy is to torture a woman to death. Would you like to hear about it? Sharon went on to say that she had a fascination with this topic of torturing someone to death and that she, of course, couldn't speak about it with her friends and family in her real life because of fear of judgment. So she said on these forums that if anyone was interested in talking about this topic more, they could email her at gina108 at AI AOL.com. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the time of the AOL email addresses. So Sharon continued having these private conversations with these men that had a fantasy about torturing a woman to death. And most of these men were anonymous and the conversations were going back and forth. And then Sharon started to reveal that it was her deepest, darkest desire to be tortured herself and murdered. She wanted to be tortured to death. And again, is this real? Because if you go on Sharon's past behavior, most of what she says online is a lie. She just does things to kind of get the attention of others online and to ultimately try and get money out of them. But then given what goes on to happen in today's case, it will be revealed that what Sharon is saying is completely true. And following this, Sharon, posing as Gina, started posting in various different forums that she was looking for a willing participant to torture her to death. And unbelievably, a lot of people said yes. Uh huh, I know. What the actual hell? A lot of people said yes. A lot of people responded to her. Some people responded saying, yes, I'll do it. It is my ultimate fantasy to torture a woman to death. However, it turns out that the majority of men that Sharon was talking to that responded and said that they would torture her to death thought that Sharon wasn't being serious. They thought it was a little bit of just like internet fantasy role playing. They didn't actually think that Sharon was being serious. They didn't actually think that she was looking for someone to torture her to death. So as soon as these anonymous men that Sharon was messaging, talking to, as soon as they realized that Sharon was being serious, they backed out. They were like, yeah, no, I'm out. I thought you were joking. I thought we were just gonna role play. I thought you were just going to pretend to be dead. They didn't actually want to kill somebody, which is reassuring. And Sharon was also kicking up a storm in the sex and bondage communities online because the vast majority of people in these communities wanted to talk about their fantasies and their fetishes in a safe way. The last thing that they wanted was for an actual murder to happen. The last thing that they wanted was for someone like Sharon to be going around begging people to torture her to death. One, they didn't want someone to die. And two, they didn't want the bondage community to be tarnished. They didn't want the stigma. I mean, they already face stigma. I mean, that still happens today. If you are into anything that is remotely different, people judge you. So the bondage community were like, we need to stop her. Like we need to try and do something about this. So a lot of people People were getting into contact with Sharon. A lot of people tried to put a stop to this. People were getting in contact with Sharon, telling her that she should talk to somebody, that she should contact safe sex hotlines. People were sending over advice like leaflets and stuff just to help her out. People were genuinely concerned about Sharon. People were telling Sharon that she needs to have a safe distinction between fantasy and reality. But Sharon wasn't listening. She didn't want to listen. She just kept saying things things like, I want to surrender completely. I want to die. And then she said things to these activists, quote, I want the real thing. I didn't ask for you preaching to me. But no one could get through to Sharon. And again, you might be thinking, surely this is fake. Like, surely she doesn't actually want to be tortured to death. But it turns out that this was going to become Sharon's reality. And it all began when she came across a man that she met in a sex forum called Robert Glass. So in 1996, Robert Glass was 45 years old. He was a computer engineer who worked for the government programming tax roles. He had a wife named Sherry who he had been married to for a very long time. They had three children together who were the the ages 10, 7, and 6. And Robert has just been described as a quiet, quite introverted man. And he was just normal, like as normal as you can get. He just lived a normal domestic lifestyle. However, that was far, far 
from the truth. Being a computer engineer, Robert was obsessed with computers. They were his biggest passion and he would spend pretty much all of his spare time locked in the basement on his computer. And what his wife didn't know is that Robert was going on some questionable websites. So he was visiting a lot of niche sex forums. He had a fetish for extreme violence and torture porn. And slowly as time went on and Robert spent more and more time in the basement, his wife Sherry just noticed that he never gave her any attention. Just over time, Robert's behavior really changed. The more time he spent in the basement, the more he pulled away from his family. For example, when Sherry would go up to hug Robert, he would pull away. Robert never wanted to be intimate with Sherry anymore. Robert never said that he loved his wife anymore. And it got so bad that Sherry's children, one of them actually went up to their mom and said, mommy, why doesn't daddy love you anymore? So one day when Robert was at work, Sherry was thinking to herself, what does he do in that basement? Why is he always down there? He never shows me any attention. He never shows the children any attention. What does he do down there? So Sherry decides to go down to the basement. She goes down to the basement. She goes to Robert's computer and she came across thousands of sexual conversations that Robert had stored on his hard drive. And these weren't just any kind of like flirty sexual conversations. Oh no, no. Robert had been using a pseudonym of either Toy Man or Slow Hand, like that was his name on these forums. And all of these messages that Robert was sending and receiving were disturbing. They were very graphic. They were very, very violent. Like extremely violent. And when Sherry saw these messages, her world just completely fell apart because she realized in that moment that she didn't know who her husband was. So later that evening, she confronted Robert about all of these messages. And when she did, Sherry has said that the color just completely drained out of Robert's face. He was so shocked that Sherry had found all of these conversations. Because again, you have to remember, this is 1990. Most people didn't know how to use a computer. So Robert thought that his wife would never be able to go down to the basement and figure out how to use this computer and then also find all of the sexual conversations that I have stored. So he was so shocked that she actually found them. So in May of 1996, Sherry wanted to leave her husband. So she filed for divorce. She moved out and she took the three children with her. And this is like a mini spoiler, but I think she found a lot more on his computer than just sexual conversations. Mm -hmm. So now we get to August of 1996. This is three months after Robert has gotten a divorce. And at this point, his sexual fantasies had gone into overdrive. He was constantly visiting sex forums. His fantasies were getting more and more extreme. And this is when he came across none other than Sharon Lepatka, who was again posting as Nancy Carlson. So at this point, Sharon was approaching her 35th birthday. And when they started talking, they just couldn't stop. And this is when Sharon, as Nancy, told Robert that she had a fantasy that she wanted to be tortured to death. And this was like music to Robert's ears. So Robert was going by the pseudonym Slow Hand. Don't ask me what that means. I mean, I'm sure it means something sexual, but I really don't want to think about it when it comes to Robert. So Robert started to say that he had a fetish for torture. He said that he was a good lover and that he was born on Valentine's Day and that he was willing to make all of Nancy's wishes come true. And this is when Sharon, as Nancy, told Robert, or should I say slow hand, that she had a fantasy that she wanted to be tortured to death. And Sharon went into graphic detail about how she wanted to be tortured, exactly what she wanted done to her. Now, I don't have any examples for you, unfortunately, but to be honest, I don't really want examples. I think we can all imagine maybe what some of the torture that Sharon wanted. Just know that she was going into graphic detail about what she wanted Robert to do to her and ultimately what she wanted done to kill her. And these conversations went on for six weeks. And over these weeks, Sharon and Robert exchanged 900 emails. Yeah, you heard that right. 900 
emails. And if you printed off all of these emails, they added up to 870 pages. Let that sink in. That is three, two at least, but three novels. And I really wish that I had some of these emails so I could figure out, were they being serious? Like, what were the nature of these emails? Like, what were they arranging? But we don't, so we just kind of have to use our imagination. But what were they getting out of this? I assume Robert was getting sexual gratification by the thought of torturing a woman, which he claimed to be his fetish. What was Sharon getting out of this? Did she actually want to be tortured to death. I'm sorry, I just find it really hard to wrap my head around someone wanting to be tortured to death. I just don't know how you can have a fantasy or a fetish about something that you can't experience. Does that make sense? Like you can't experience death because it's death and you'll be dead. It's not like you can change your mind. Like death is final. I just really struggle to wrap my head around that. Like I just truly struggle to believe that Sharon was being serious, but apparently she was. Because you might not think that Sharon was going to follow through with her wishes, because let's be realistic, Sharon doesn't really follow through with anything, does she? She always backs out, she's always scamming people, but this time she followed through. She was being deadly serious, literally. And this is where Sharon's fantasy would turn into her deadly reality. So now we get to the 13th of October, 1996. This is when 35-year-old Sharon starts to put her plan in motion to finally meet her torturer and murderer Robert Glass in person. Over the few weeks prior to October 13th, the two of them had been making this plan to finally get together and October 13th was finally the day. So early that morning, Sharon got out of bed pretty early. She went and had breakfast with her husband because yeah it's really really easy to forget that Sharon is married and remember that her husband has no idea about this secret life that Sharon has been living on the internet. So Sharon tells her husband that she is going to Georgia for a few days to visit some friends. Obviously she wasn't but her husband Victor didn't know this at the time and another thing that Victor didn't know about is that Sharon had left him a note. She had left him a note in the house that simply read, if my body is never retrieved, don't worry, no, I'm at peace. Oh my god, but obviously Victor doesn't know about this note right now. So after breakfast, Sharon says goodbye to her husband before arriving at the train depot in Baltimore, where she boards a train that is going to take her to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where Robert Glass lived. And her train departed at 9.15 a.m. before arriving in Charlotte, North Carolina at 8.45 p.m., that is like a 12 hour train journey. And I'm like, what the hell? What the hell? But I'm from the UK. I feel like you can get most places in three to four, maybe five hours on a train. In the UK, a 12 hour train journey seems so long, but I don't know. Maybe it's not that long if you are from the US. Like, let me know. But anyway, Sharon finally arrives in Charlotte, North Carolina at 8.45 p.m. on the 13th of October and Robert is there to pick her up. And this is when Sharon comes face to face with her torturer for the first time. Following this, they climb into Robert's pickup truck and then they drive the 80 mile trip to Robert's trailer. And all I kept thinking about was how awkward that car journey must have been. You have literally just met somebody that has agreed to kill you. What do you talk about? So they eventually arrive at Robert's trailer and when Sharon walks into his trailer, it is a mess. It is so, so dirty. It is filthy. There are unwashed clothes piled on the floor, unwashed dishes in the sink. There was rotting food everywhere. The smell was absolutely awful and Robert also had four dogs running around and they were messing everywhere and it was just filthy. It was just disgusting. So even though the place was 
disgusting and dirty. Sharon didn't care and the two of them got right to business. Yeah, pretty much from the get-go, from the moment Sharon walked into that trailer, they both started having sex. Lots and lots of sex, which included a lot of torture. Sharon allowed Robert to tie her up in whatever way he wanted. She also allowed Robert to probe her with various different objects. And apparently she allowed Robert to do pretty much whatever he wanted. And all of this sexual activity went on for three days three whole days. Now, we don't know the exact details of their sexual activity. We know that it was violent. Obviously, both of them fantasized about torture. But all we do know is that Robert was having the time of his life. However, we have to remember that the ultimate plan for both Robert and Sharon was for Robert to torture Sharon to death. And we truly do not know what was going on in that trailer. We do not know the conversation that the two of them are having. We don't know whether Sharon really did truly want to be tortured to death. However, what was about to happen is that Sharon's husband, Victor, was about to find the note that Sharon had left him in the home. And from the discovery of this note, the terrible and deadly truth of what happened in that trailer would soon be revealed. Because on the 20th of October, 1996, one whole week after Sharon had apparently left to go visit friends in Georgia, this is when Victor found Sharon's note, which if you remember said, quote, if my body is never retrieved, don't worry, know that I'm at peace. And when Victor I read this note, he immediately started to panic because the note, it didn't sound like his wife because Victor was not aware of the secret life that she was living on the internet. He was thinking to himself, what has she gotten herself into? Is she in trouble? Is she safe? So Victor immediately called the police. And when they came over to the home to investigate his wife's disappearance, they asked Victor if they could have access to his wife, Sharon's computer. And when the police went on to Sharon's computer, this is when her secret life life was revealed. They came across the 900 emails that Sharon had sent to Robert Glass. I mean, obviously he was known as Slowhand. They didn't know his name right now. But they came across these emails where Sharon was apparently asking this anonymous man to torture her to death. And when the police read these emails, they were thinking, surely not, but surely, surely not. But because Sharon had been missing for a week and because of the note that she had left in the home, they had to take this seriously. And eventually they were able to uncover Slowhand's real identity as Robert Glass. They found his address and they turned up at his trailer. And this was now the 22nd of October, 1996, nine days after Sharon had left to go see friends. But the police decided that instead of just barging into Robert's trailer, they were going to stake the place out, see if Sharon was still alive. I mean, the police at this moment didn't even know that Robert was responsible for anything. He had just been exchanging emails with Sharon. God knows if Sharon had actually gone to him. So the police, they stake out the place for three days. They just sit and watch Robert's trailer. They watch as every single day, Robert got up. He went to work. He came back on the evening, stayed in his trailer. Next day, got up, went to work. And they watched him do this for three days, but they did not see Sharon. There was no sign of her. So this is when the police started thinking, what about if Sharon is there? What about if she's tied up somewhere? Maybe she's there against her will. Like what if, what if? So the police couldn't hold off for any longer. So one of the days when Robert was at work, the police obtained a search warrant and stormed into Robert's trailer. And they came across the exact same scene that Sharon had come across when she first went to the trailer. It was a mess. It was so dirty, filthy. However, this time the police found a load of drugs everywhere, as well as a load of sex toys and bondage equipment. It was very clear that sexual activity had taken place in this trailer recently, but there was no Sharon. Like there, She was nowhere to be seen. So after searching the inside of the trailer, police make their way to the outside and they looked around for any evidence outside. And this is now when they would make an absolutely shocking 
discovery. Because just behind Robert's trailer, the police came across a freshly dug mound of soil and it kind of looked suspicious. So the police start digging, digging and digging. And when they dug approximately two and a half feet below the surface, this is when they stumbled across human remains. They first found a kneecap, then a leg bone, and they kept digging and digging, and it turned out that buried in Robert's backyard was the body of Sharon Lepadka. Unbelievably, it seems like Robert did carry out the torture to death fantasy that both him and Sharon had. So after this absolutely shocking discovery, the police rush over to Robert's place of work and immediately arrest him. An autopsy is then carried out on Sharon's body and it was found that her hands and feet had been bound with rope. A nylon cord had been strung around her neck and she had cuts and bruises all over her neck and breasts. It didn't take long for the examiner to conclude that some sexual torture had occurred, but ultimately the cause of death was strangulation. So the police immediately get Robert in an interview room and they ask him what happened? Why is this woman buried in your backyard? Why has she been strangled? Now Robert immediately panics. I think for some reason he thought that he was going to get away with this. I mean again you have to remember that it's 1996 and obviously this was the beginning of the internet and I think he truly thought that because he was emailing Sharon anonymously he wasn't using his real name. He didn't think that the emails would get traced back to him. So because he was really taken aback that he had even been caught, he went into full on panic mode and just started saying, it was an accident. It was an accident. I swear I never meant to kill her. It was a sex game gone wrong. But then the police presented Robert with all of the emails that had been sent between himself and Sharon, which explicitly stated that Robert agreed to torture Sharon to death. And again, Robert went into panic mode and he told the police exactly what happened. At least he told the police his side of the story. He said that after Sharon had arrived to the trailer, they had engaged in violent, consensual sex. Robert had done nothing against Sharon's will. Sharon had asked for everything. She had consented to everything. He violently beat her during sex until she bled. Sharon was the one asking him to be violent to torture her and he happily obliged. And then on the third day, Sharon asked to be strangled during sex. So Robert tied Sharon up. He bound her hands and feet with rope. He then pulled out the nylon cord and wrapped it around her throat and began to choke her as they were having sex. And Robert was applying more and more pressure and he was doing it for longer and longer each time until eventually Sharon's oxygen supply completely cut off. And it was in this moment where Sharon the Patka lost her life and then Robert buried her in his backyard. Again, Robert placed emphasis on the fact that it was an accident, that he didn't mean to kill her, that he apparently never knew any of this was going to happen. But the police were having none of it because in these emails, Robert had explicitly stated that he wanted to torture Sharon to death and kill her. So Robert Glass is charged with first degree murder and Robert is held in jail awaiting trial and his case drags on for a couple of years. It takes the police quite a while to do their investigations because this was a pretty complex case. I mean, it's not every day that you come across a case where there's been possibly consensual murder. But whilst they were doing their investigation, they obviously had access to Robert's computer and his hard drive and everything. And what did the police find? They found indecent images of children. Mm -hmm. Yep, images, videos, the lot. So not only is Robert a murderer. He's also a pedophile. So he's a lovely man, isn't he? And it just really, really, really makes me sick to my stomach. When you remember that Robert has children 
young children. And remember Sherry, his wife, when she went on his computer and that led to the divorce? I wonder if she also found those images of children. I have no evidence of that. I mean, she found a lot on his computer and it led to divorce, so she may have also found those images. So following the discovery of the indecent images of children on Robert's computer, he was also charged with six counts of second degree sexual exploitation, as well as his murder charge. And when the story of Robert and Sharon broke in the media, as you can imagine, the media ran with it because this was one of the first murder cases that had really taken place over the internet. And the media were running with the narrative of the internet is dangerous, no one should be using it, especially children, no one should be using the internet, it's bad. Which obviously the internet is not bad, there just happens to be bad people using the internet. And then eventually in January 2000, which is three years after the murder of Sharon, it was decided that Robert was no longer going to go to trial because he had decided to take a plea deal. He accepted a deal which reduced his charge from first degree murder to voluntary manslaughter because Robert kept arguing that it was an accident and Sharon had consented to participate in violent sexual acts. And given the child exploitation charges that Robert also had, you would think, you really would think that Robert was going to go to prison for a very, very long time. Well, you would be wrong. He was sentenced to three to four years for the voluntary manslaughter. Only three to four years for voluntary manslaughter of Sharon, which in my opinion is not voluntary manslaughter, it is murder. But okay, he is only given three to four years and then he is only given 21 months in prison for the possession of indecent child images. 21 months, that's less than two years. What the hell? Which meant that he would be released in less than six years. And that six years would also include time served. And he has already spent three years in jail, meaning that Robert was only going to spend an extra two and a bit years in prison. However, it would turn out that Robert would never actually leave prison because on the 20th of February, 2002, two weeks before he was due to be released, Robert Glass died of a heart attack and he would never see the outside world ever again. And that was the case of Sharon the Patka, which is a case about consensual murder. And you guys are going to have to let me know all of your thoughts, theories, and opinions on today's case. And I know you have them. And I have a lot of opinions on today's case. Wow, I have a lot of opinions. So first of all, point blank, you cannot consent to murder. In my eyes, it is as simple as that. There is no gray area. This is black and white. You cannot consent to murder. And I'm not talking about assisted suicide here. That is a completely different conversation. I'm talking about murder and you cannot consent to murder. And in my opinion, it's dangerous to even entertain the idea that someone can consent to murder. How many cases have there been where the perpetrator has used the defense of rough sex gone wrong or we were just role playing and it was an accident? They consented, not my fault. How many times have we seen that in cases? And if we start to even entertain the idea that someone can consent to murder, that just opens up the door for a defense for all of these perpetrators that are murderers. And at the end of the day, you can't prove that the person gave consent because they're dead. Just like in this case, you technically cannot prove that Sharon gave consent to be murdered because consent can be withdrawn at any time. Just because you give consent once, that is not blanket consent for forever. You can change your mind. So in the case of Sharon, in the emails that she was sending to Robert, she was giving consent to be murdered, to be tortured to death. But how do we know that she didn't change her mind once she got to the trailer? How do we know that she didn't arrive at the trailer, participate in some violent sex and change her mind? We don't know that. And we can't know that because Sharon is dead. And what about if Sharon was there tied up in the trailer and thought, you know what? I don't actually want to do this anymore. I'm not really into this. I don't want to die. What about if she changed her mind and Robert, being the sick and twisted individual that he is, said, 
Mm -mm. No, 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 that is not what we're doing. You gave consent and I'm going to murder you. And that's the thing with this case. We just don't know. Sharon may have given consent all the way up to the very end, but we don't know. And therefore, I think it's dangerous to even entertain the idea that someone can consent to murder. And when I was doing my research on today's case, I was getting so frustrated because the narrative surrounding this case is that it's not really serious. The narrative is, oh, well, she consented to murder. She asked for it. A lot of the narrative is that Sharon is not a quote unquote proper victim. And that was just making me really frustrated. But she's still a victim. We don't know what Sharon actually wanted. We don't know truly what happened in that trailer. And as for Sharon, there's not really much I can say at the end of this video. Sadly, her parents distanced themselves from Sharon after this case came out because they were so embarrassed by their daughter. They were so embarrassed by what she had done. I don't know how Sharon's husband reacted to this case. So I don't don't even know if Sharon got a proper send-off. I couldn't find an obituary for her online and I can't give you any more details about Sharon as a person. And again, that just makes me so sad. So that is the end of today's video. You'll have to let me know your thoughts, theories, and opinions. I am very curious to see what you will think of today's case because I can imagine that today's case will divide opinions. I don't know. I, I just don't know. And I also wanted to end this video letting you all know that this is my last video of 2023. I cannot believe where this year has gone. I also hit 900k. What the hell? Oh my god, thank you so much. Like truly that is mind-boggling to me. That many people. That is crazy. That is a number I never ever in a million years thought that I would hit and that is kind of terrifying that many people have subscribed to my channel and I try not to think about it because it really does freak me out but oh my god thank you so much that is such a nice way to end a really really tough year for me I feel like a broken record I remember in my last video of last year I said this exact same thing I said that 2022 was one of the hardest years of my life but wow I was not expecting what 2023 had in store for me because 2023 in my personal life was probably one of the most, if not the most difficult years of my life. Wow, I didn't mean to cry at the end of this video, but there has been a lot going on in my personal life, which um, I try and keep separate to my work. But this past year has been incredibly hard. And I just want to thank you all for your continued support for this whole year, because truly work has been keeping me going. It has been an incredible distraction from everything else that is going on. And just you guys watching my videos, giving me a like, given me a comment it truly means the world and you guys have kept me going like truly you don't know like you don't know what has been going on but just the fact that you guys support me has given me the motivation to just keep going to keep getting up keep working keep producing these videos and I owe you guys more than you will ever know and yes I'm going to shut up now before I truly burst into tears. So I truly hope that next year brings us some peace and happiness. Yeah, that is me. I'm going to go now because that was too emotional. <laughs> and I don't quite know when I will be back, but I will be back in the first week or two of January. I don't know which one yet, which is why I'm not saying, but in the first week or two of January, there will be a new video. So I won't be gone for too long. So that is everything from me. I love you guys so 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 much and I will see you all in my next video which will be in 2024 which sounds so weird to say 2024 but anyway I'll see you all next year bye